there's a podcast of the Church of God. This is being recorded for our YouTube channel as well as other podcasts that you listen to. Thank you for joining us. I'm Apostle Ernest Binion with my co-host, Apostle Stephen Hargrave. And we have a guest on our program. We have Elder John Strizu, Brother, welcome to our little podcast, brother. Yes, Thank sir. You. So we are here in Midwest City. We're at our doctrinal meeting and the Lord moved upon your heart to preach. I thought it was so appropriate because there was such a good long wait mm -hmm. and brother you moved in the lord and the lord mightily <laughs> blessed the, the message so give the title that you gave to us that you preached turning the hearts of the children to the fathers which comes out of the last part of malachi chapter four i think mm -hmm. it's actually the very last verse of malachi yes sir and so um i'd like to start off as we get into this topic because the one of the things of course that's so beautiful about the message was the passion with which you gave it even having said at one point in the message yourself that some of the things that you preached about are things that you yourself have had to struggle with and of course anytime you can bear who you are to your audience it's so effective at helping people to understand the message of the gospel but brother what i'd like to do if you will allow me to start off in a in a part i'd like you to go over genesis chapter 9 you used that text, you dealt with Moses, or excuse me, <laughs> Moses, Noah, and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And brother, you gave the best exegesis on that uh, portion of scripture that I personally have ever, ever heard. Brother Steve, I don't know, have you? Excellent. But as you walked through that, I thought, oh, that's what that means. <laughs> it was so enlightening to me. And I think a good foundation to start for the message that you, that you preached and why we want to talk about this, because Moving, moving from just the message, which we hope you'll go to Gospel Trumpet Radio or the um, Gospel Trumpet app, get that, download that, and listen to it, or find it on our YouTube channel. Um, I think it's so such a big topic. As you were preaching, we looked at each other and said, podcast, mm -hmm. like this is a big, big topic that affects the world over. We have traveled, you've traveled the world, you know this. It's, it's, this is not a U.S phenomenon that you're preaching about that the Lord laid on your heart. So yes, if you walk us through Genesis 9, you can read, you can talk, you can do however you want to do it, but walk us through Genesis 9. The Lord gave you that as a burden to bring out your point. So kind of lay that as a foundation as we move forward with our podcast today. So um, this is actually when I was reading in Genesis chapter 9 is where the um, inspiration for this message came from originally. <laughs> okay, well, then, I'm, um, then I'm good to start off in that place. <laughs> I just started reading in the book of Genesis and personal devotions and as I came to chapter 9 I I read this first which I knew of the incident but had never considered it as such and with brother Randy Hargrave teaching recently on fathers and everything um, it, it really came across different to me so we can begin reading here in chapter 9 um, and verse 20, Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, mm -hmm. and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. So this is after the flood. That's correct. Okay. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have really no background on this. We, This is really, I think, the first time that we even see drunkenness in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So... God hadn't condemned it as far as we know. I'm not saying that he hadn't, but I mean, from what we know, mm -hmm. it wasn't even necessarily that he was... In the wrong of any kind. Right. I mean, we don't, we don't know where he stood um, as far as spiritually, I think, on this. But he had come through a tremendous event in history, which was the destruction of the whole world besides himself and his family and a few animals that were on board the ark that God had given him the commandment to do. Um, so Noah is no doubt considered as a hero of faith. We see him in Hebrews chapter 11. He's a great man, um, a great calling that many people would have never been able to live up to. That's right. That's, um, that's a very good point. Very but good then point. again, we do see the fact that, we, that he was a human. Mm -hmm. um, he had shortcomings. He had problems. Um, and we see Ham walking in on his father and seeing this, and perhaps he had never seen his father as this before. I, I mean, we don't know. Uh, perhaps up to this time he was a hero in Ham's mind, 
and then all of a sudden he sees him in a moment of weakness. So it, it kind of seems to change everything in Ham's mind or perspective on his father. And he can't help himself. He walks out and mocks his father to his two brethren, who, upon hearing of their father, it seems that something burned in their hearts like, no, like that's our father. We can't let this be like that. Mm -hmm. And so they uh, take a sheet. There obviously must have been some discourse between the two of them, like, what are we going to do? we got to do something and help our father. And so they come in backwards and cover the nakedness of their father. Um, so that's, that's where the inspiration for the, the message came from. I actually taught a young people's class in Greenville on this previously, um, dealing with the same thing respecting our fathers, um, dealing more with the young people on the physical father. I think it's easy as a young person, as you start to come into those years where you start to question everything, you mm -hmm. start to mature, um, grow up, you know, and you really have an opinion and a say on everything. Um, and it's easy to disconnect yourself from your father or try to. And my burden in teaching the young people is trying to relate to them from things that I personally have dealt with. And I can remember as a young person, it seemed to be the fad back in the Huber Heights days. Um, this where, is in Ohio. Right. Okay. Where, 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 we, where I grew up as a young Christian, um, it seemed to be the thing that we went around and found ourselves different parents. So mm -hmm. we kind of adopted other parents to call mom and dad. Um, and so I've just been considering those things, considering the young people as they deal with these things. And it's easy to see things in our parents as young people that, that we just think, oh, that's terrible. Like, like, or be embarrassed about things that mm -hmm. we see. Like, dad, don't you think? Like, mm -hmm. um, like stop doing that. You're embarrassing Embarrass us. Embarrass me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> And yet, at the same time, like, if we're honest and look really close, um, maybe it's embarrassing because we see ourselves. for a reason. And we don't want other people to know who we are. So it's, it's because of that, I think, some too. So here we have this man of faith who, as you said, in Hebrews chapter 11, he's called that. He's obviously a Christian hero at a low point, which one of the beauties of the message that you brought out in my mind was you 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 made the christian the the believer in god he stays human and i think so often the times in the scriptures our heroes or faith are not human they're, right. they're super there's something that we can never attain to um so on the one hand many people couldn't do what noah did in the ark certainly another person could have done it it, it was a, he was just a man like like any of us but what's so beautiful here is you dealt with the fact that here's Noah at a low point. And the scriptures hardly do this. We always see the high points. We see the, the victories, the glories, the successes, because there's a, there's a narrative that it's trying to get us through. But here we get a glimpse into, you know, Peter's folly and, and, and different people in the Bible that do things that were like, you know, hindsight, we're like, ooh, you should not have done that. Right. You know, Jacob should not have lied to his father uh, in order to obtain the birthright, you know. Um, and we, we can just go down through history. So here he's this man, and he's at a low point. And I love how you brought that out, that he's very human, but he's still their father. Mm -hmm. Right. Th that, that's an important... Um, point that we need to try to highlight for our listeners that just because somebody fails that doesn't totally abdicate our responsibility to have loyalty to be respectful um, to find ways to as the scriptures say cover the multitude of sins which is the higher higher road to take than to right. everybody can jump on your mistakes Everybody it can all, jump on your failures. So I'm looking at a table of three, you know, there's three of us here. And because we know one another, you know, we could pick apart our dads. That, that would not be hard for the three of us to of do. Course. Each one of us, different dad circumstances in our lives. Mm -hmm. We could pick those men apart. That's not, that's not hard. My children, your children, yours are a little bit young, mine are older. But, you know, our children could pick us apart if that's what they wanted to do. So I really hmm. appreciated how you brought out this. This is a human being who 
has this legacy of greatness. <laughs> right. I mean, we're talking no, about no, the good. kind of greatness that's actually a good point. that is, um, you know, one in a in a you know billions. He he does what only one person in the known world could do. He does it, mm -hmm. and Ham has the audacity to actually forsake everything that he and this is what you bring out that he actually owes to his father mm -hmm. because of one shortcoming failure yes. and and really by the message wouldn't you say brother john it's not actually limited to one fault right i think you brought out i'd like you to talk about this i think you brought out it really doesn't matter if your husband if your husband your father was downright awful would you say that that's true? Would you say for our listeners that would watch this, you know, somebody might be watching that has had a horrible father relationship. They were absent maybe. Um, they were abusive possibly. They were not a provider. They were lazy. They were a bum. They were, you know, whatever the case may be. But that doesn't actually remove any re responsibility that God has placed on us to, as children, whether that's an adult or a child, to find a way through the grace of God to turn our hearts back to those same people. Yes. Right. Um, we definitely see in the scriptures commandments regarding our father, <clears throat> excuse me, our fathers, respecting them, honoring them. Um, and it doesn't say honor your dad if he's a good dad, it just says honor your father. Um, there are multiple unfortunate situations excuse me, situations in the world where um, fathers are not the fathers that they should be, should have been. And it's very easy and almost seems justified to be bitter against them. Mm -hmm. um, it it's definitely seems like you have a reason to be or can seem that way. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with that is, is ideally we would want the heart of the father to be turned to the child and then which is the first portion of the prophecy right. in malachi right and then the heart of the child turned to the father mm -hmm. that's not always going to happen that way um, sometimes the heart of the child will be turned to the father and with that turning the heart of the father can be turned to the child um, to be bitter against your father is really just to cut yourself off from any help, mm -hmm. because the help for your own personal. Why, why, do right. you, why do you? Could you explain? Yeah. Uh, why do you say that? So I say so that you're because bitter and, it's, and you cut off yourself from help. Why? Why do you say that? Because that's your dad. I mean, which is half of you, because mm -hmm. you're half of your father, half of your your half your father and half your mother. So the weaknesses that your dad has, the shortcomings that he has, the problems that he has the ways that he's chosen to operate and do things really reflects on you mm -hmm. and has a large part to do with who you are and who you become. So, no, please, go, you're gonna say something so, else. So to be bitter against that is to reject who you are. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. It's never wrong to see things that are wrong. Right, that's what we tell the truth about that's, it. That's right, what stated. right, and deal with it. That's true. But most people, or I think bitterness comes from the fact of not even dealing with it. It's something that, that you see and you don't want to deal with. You run away from it and just mm -hmm. hold it in your heart against them rather than opening up and dealing with it so that healing can come. Hmm. So when people are bitter because of their parents, you know, lack or whatever, for whatever reason, you're saying that the, the real sufferer in bitterness is the one that harbors the bitterness. I think so, yes. So, so, so what do we tell them? What do the scriptures teach? What is your burden? You know, talk more about, you know, you read the scripture, the Lord's opening this up to you. Talk about, you know, any point really that you want that talks about dealing with this kind of bitterness and how people are, should work through this. So I think personally that there's some fathers that will never be redeemed, except for that their children are redeemed first and their hearts mm -hmm. turn back to their fathers. Um, so to hold that, that bitterness, that no, <laughs> it should be the other I, way I'm around. I'm trying to ask the question the person that listens to, but it's not fair. He hurt me. Why should I be the one that goes back 
and tries to make reconciliation. If I go back, I'm just going to get hurt again. But brother, isn't there, okay, I'm sorry, let me interject here, but isn't there a respect for oneself? It's, it's not just the regard for the Father, but isn't the regard for the Father a reflection of the respect that you have for yourself, number one? And it seems like I see that in, in these brothers here, in Shem and Japheth. It seems like I see them respecting, okay, what are people going to think about our Father? Yes. But then, what will they think about us? Right. And then what will our children think? Like, what is going to be the world's narrative about my family? Not just my father, right. but about me, my family, what happened. <laughs> so isn't there a respect that we have for ourselves that stems from, or the respect for ourselves that actually helps us to go back in a situation where really it's not even fair? It's to we, we actually, in, in, for all intents and purposes, we really should be bitter according to what some would say. Right. So do you, you feel like that there's some aspect of respect for us that helps us in this? Yes, definitely. Um, so could you give, if I could get you to do this, maybe share any personal testimony, personal experience that you would say as a young person, as you went through what you said we tend to go through, did you go through some of that? Talk about how that worked in your life. Brother, we probably should say, and don't forget that, we probably should say, his parents are wonderful. Yes, <laughs> yeah, by the way. <laughs> yeah, his parents are wonderful. Yes. They're from, they actually, your father actually escaped from Romania. I, really, we need to record, we've recorded it sometimes, but we need to record him giving his story. His, brother, his story is tremendous of escaping. Excellent. And I think, uh, and I, I couldn't say this for sure, you, you can speak for yourself here very shortly, but I think, so they have a heavy, both parents have a heavy accent. So and you're first generation American. Yes, yes sure. so they have a heavy accent, and so uh, they remember the old country. We know them well, so we call it old, the old country, Romania. So some of that had to be some of what you were trying, as you developed, as you grew, the accent and trying to reconcile all these things. Uh, some of that had to play a factor with your personal experiences and how you had to come to a place where you realized, look, I really need to honor. I need to put more honor on my father and, and understand more and respect myself. Some of that had to come into play. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So I think we can go back to the bitterness. Mm -hmm. um, to see the shortcomings, to look through the lens of bitterness, everything's bad mm -hmm. or becomes bad at some point. Mm -hmm. And I think that growing up, I, I definitely, I know that I did not appreciate my dad as I should have and didn't respect him as I should have. Um, but then, like, when you change the way that you view your father, like, like he's not all bad, maybe mm. there's some good things, and you try to find the good things, then the bad things don't really seem that bad after all. Mm. You know, it's like, well, that wasn't that bad, you know? I mean, like, <laughs> Do you yeah, I mean, it wasn't as good as it could have been, sure. maybe, but, but it wasn't that bad. Does know? life press you into that? Like, does, does just maturity and experience and life well, and seeing your own children, <laughs> does that kind of press you into some understanding, like, wait a minute? That wasn't that bad, you know. Yes, sir, I think so. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Well, thank the Lord. And uh, so there, there actually has to be... You know, it might be good just for our please. listeners, brother. You have how many siblings? There's 14 total. So you are one of 14 children. Yes, you have 13 sir. siblings. So you had quite an upbringing in a household, a large family. Um, yes, sir. Parents who were immigrants to this country, so they are you know, keeping old traditions in mm -hmm. a new world, raising children who are inundated with the new world life, and it had to have made for a pretty interesting mm -hmm. um, life. You all didn't grow up wealthy. No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you had to learn some of life's, le life's lessons out of necessity. Yes, sir. It's good. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, so moving forward in, in, in dealing with your topic. So let's, let's kind of dig in a little bit more. So what is, if in, in, in your elevator speech, what's the burden of the message of charting the hearts of the children to the fathers? So I think... And I, and I think you have two, really, but from, from the message that I took away, but go ahead and... So we can go to Malachi chapter 4 and verse 6, the, the text of the, the message. Um, and I didn't, I didn't even recognize this. I mean, I knew this, but I didn't mention it when I preached. Malachi 4, verse 6 is the very last verse of the Old mm -hmm. Testament. And I think it's a very fitting closing verse. All right. Um, for two reasons. Because, one, it, it sums up 
the lack in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, mm -hmm. and sums up, secondly, the um, the solution for the lack in the New Covenant. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very perfect bridge going from the Old Covenant into the New. In what way? Showing the 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 lack and the solution for the lack. Yes. And, and that. bridging that. The lack being? The, the fathers not being turned to the children, not being there as fathers. So I think we see that also in the 400 years of darkness where there was mm -hmm. no prophet, no spiritual father, mm -hmm. and what that produced. So this is actually a two-part um, lacking here. It's, it's both a lack of the, the labor of love that comes from a physical father, but also that from spiritual fathers. So there's both is what you're saying. Yes, sir. Okay. I think one inveritably, inveritably produces the other. Which mm -hmm. comes first? <laughs> it's hard to say. That's a good question. <laughs> well, in, in natural course of things, certainly, right, I'm born, I have my natural parents, and, and as fathers, we should be leading mm -hmm. our children to spiritual fathers. Right, but when there's mm -hmm. a spiritual lack, then it causes the physical fathers to lack. So there should be a spiritual father to help lead the fathers mm -hmm. to be fathers that lead them to the spiritual fathers. Which right. always goes back to the system that's in place to produce the lack in the fathers so that they can't pass that along and be what they need to be for the children. So you so said something right. really beautiful in the message about there's not a man that is self-made. You said that. Yes, sir. You explained that, that thought there and take them all the way back as you did if you remember doing that in the message. So um, everyone's connected to somebody. No, what, no one's just been dropped off in the earth. To, to make yourself and be yourself or whatever. Who you are comes from who you were raised by. Uh, even if your father wasn't there, you're still half of him through genes. Right. So you still somehow inherit his personality um, who makes him who he is and makes you who you are and gives you a lot of the same problems. Yes, because sir. a lot of our problems arise from differences in personalities, mm -hmm. etc. or strengths or weaknesses of different personalities that make us stronger, weak in different areas. Um, so all of that is connected to some man ultimately in our life, or even if he wasn't in our life as, as we knew him in our life, he's still part of our life. That's right. Um, and going all the way back to Adam, Adam was created by God, so still not self-made. Everything that he had, he was given by God, and from there passed it on down to Cain and Abel and so on to every generation. Hmm. That's very good, brother. So it shows the connection with humanity, the effects that Adam, the first man and the first father, had on all humanity, which also necessitates the reason for the children to give the honor because it actually it actually structures society the way that it needs to be. That's kind of what I was hearing you say too. Like society, and even the, uh, for example, the identity crises and all those things. Society can never be what it needs to be when this is out of order, which I think is what you were saying in the message. Yes, sir. And I think that our generation is pushed to be independent, mm -hmm. be yourself. Right. Um, Speak your own truth. Right. And that's believe what you want to believe or whatever. And that's, that's very... Uh, detrimental to our physical and spiritual well-being. So there's a pushing in the younger generation. I think this generation is Generation Z now, the, young, the youngest mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. So there's a push in the world for there to be this generation gap, for there to be, it's almost fostering a lack of appreciation, fostering a disrespect. Would you say that? Yes, sir. I think, I, I, I think it's all very subtle, like it's mm -hmm. not, they wouldn't tell you hate your dad or whatever necessarily, but mm -hmm. Uh, the way that, that the generation is, is driven is, is to separate them from the fathers. So, example, you, I, I've heard you teach on this. Um, any children's books come to mind? That <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, the Bernstein Bears by Jan and Stan Bernstein. Mm. So, what, what about that? Share that for our audience. And I'll say this, that Jan and Stan Bernstein do deny that there was any um, intentional. intentional disrespect portrayed in their books. Whether or not that's true, I'm not going to deal with that. The fact is that it is there. And it could be, if it is true, that it wasn't intentional, it's a natural product because of right. the way that they were raised right. it's the and effects. the way that their right. family has become. It's just an indication of and the so effects. even if right. it was just stories about themselves, um, they're a victim of a society that mm -hmm. is producing fatherless children. 
So I, it seems that in reading the books, and I read many of the books growing up, I mean, it was funny children's stories, you know. Uh, everyone laughs and, and misses really well, the, who, the, the, the the burden. The issue, though, before you mm. go on, I'm sorry, but what are they laughing about? What's funny? The, the chief thing that's funny in the book. Which is a father who is very clumsy. He's a doofus. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what's funny. And it's the same as the Simpsons, Simpsons Simpson, show. Simpsons. Homer Simpson, right? Um, married with children. Yes. And even, even I'll, I'll say that married with children, definitely. But even Bill Cosby would slip into some, some of that. That's right. And start talking about how the father, you know, he doesn't really know much. And, you know, he's just around. Where's your mother? And the mother, to, the mom is the boss and she's guiding me around. So even he uh, fell into some of that. So what's interesting is the, you, you know what they say makes comedy work, right? Mm -hmm. It's only funny when it's, it's true. true. Mm -hmm. So it's the, it's the apparent truth of dad shouldn't be the clumsy one. Dad shouldn't be mm. the doofus. Dad should be the leader of his home. Right. Dad should have it together. Mm. And when dad doesn't meet that expectation, oh, that's funny. Mm -hmm. It's the acknowledgement of mm -hmm. the, um, the, the paradox that that's not how it should be. It, it, mm -hmm. it, it's something else, and that's what made it funny. Well, is that in the conscience, people, at least at that time, would have, should have felt like, I'm laughing at this, but that's not how really it's supposed to be. Well, e even right. even the funniness, and, and I'm going to let you appreciate the message, but even the funniness is not even only just the problem. It is that that would be the pattern of male behavior that's promoted. Which is what? Because you can laugh at your dad. Because like, you dad's going to do something. And bring down <laughs> that natural. Yes. So when I was in the world, and I, and I was all out, okay, mm -hmm. I could watch comedy mm -hmm. and bad language and, and sexual innu innuendos and all kinds of stuff. But there was something in me, and we're not off topic here. Mm -hmm. There was something in me. When they got to the God jokes, yeah, yeah. I would be like, yeah. I start looking around, Even everybody else would be like, oh, mm -hmm. maybe I shouldn't laugh about right, that. Right, I right. might want to be a Christian someday. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't want to get struck by lightning mm -hmm. for laughing. And it didn't matter. I shouldn't have laughed at any other stuff. A right. lot of it was bad. But, but it was like when they started to do right. jokes about God, I was like, right. okay, there's a line in right. the sand. Sorry. And that line for the Father, Mm -hmm. through books like the Berenstein Bears right. was erased. Right. Um, even, even in the idea of like a Charlie Brown where he's the doofus, where you're actually seeing a child who is perpetually, you mm -hmm. know, oh brother, that's, mm -hmm. that's something he would always say in the book, that, that um, you're actually creating this persona who's always just going to be the doofus. So with the Berenstein Bears, it produces this persona and it minimizes the effects of the man. Do you think that that allows other influences to come in? Like you can, almost, you can almost mold the man into something that he absolutely was never intended to be if that persona, if that mighty strong persona is gone or even ridiculed. Sometimes it's like even the conversations that we're having, some people would ridicule this. They'd be like, what do you mean? Why does a man have to be in charge? And that's the environment today. Do you think that allows, that breaking down of that allows other identities to come in and the man kind of to assume that? Absolutely. So I believe that the Bernstein Bears books first started being published in the 60s, mm -hmm. if I'm correct. And the, uh, the Simpsons were the mid to late 80s, right. I think. That's right. Um, so what preceded that, we know the Roaring Twenties, World War I and World War II, where the fathers were taken out of the homes and all of that. So. And it's not that fathers never had troubles before that, but I believe that was the early 1900s was a big turning point for mm -hmm. that. And then that's where we start the production of the Bernstein Bears and mm -hmm. the Simpsons and so on. So it comes out of, out of things that were already out of place, the rise of, of feminism. Mm -hmm. um, so women coming to, to greater roles or whatever, working out of the home, um, et cetera which caused the father to be out of his place. Mm -hmm. So that's some of the subtlety that you were talking about. So it's not like right. they're just saying, look, kill the men. But subtly, they are destroying this image, this character, this identity that a man would have. Correct. So with, with that, do we, can we correlate prophetically, not everybody, let me just say this, we are not scientists. Mm -hmm. 
and we don't want to be, we're mm. not trying to be, mm -hmm. um, we're prophets. And we believe the more sure word of prophecy over scientific data yes. that can be bought and manipulated and, and interpreted. But we want the word of God. Can we correlate, Brother John, and I know that racism has existed long before the 20s in this country particularly, but in, even the world. Can we correlate things like Jim Crow and other forms of oppression in America and um, I almost said recidivism, that's not the right word, um, but the high incarcerate, incarceration rates of uh, minorities, drug abuse, so current drug abuse, Oxycontins and pain pills mm -hmm. in white suburbia, can that be connected? Can we make a connection between that and the same attack against fatherhood that really is a part of the burden of your message? So I think so. Um, I think we can go all the way back to Genesis um, and see, or Exodus, and see a target, a very directed target for the fathers. Mm -hmm. Um, dealing with the slavery in Egypt, the children of Israel. Uh, Pharaoh commanded that all men, all the male children would be slain to prevent an uprising, essentially. Um, and then we see also the, the, um, the children of Israel in Babylon. Um, a lot of them were, um, their, their masculinity was taken away from them. So we see Throughout history, um, throughout the Bible, we see definitely direct hits on on the very thing. I think it's never been as widespread as a problem as it is now. After all these centuries of targeting the father, it seems that it's almost been erased in our generation. There mm -hmm. is no father. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the, the attack then is is was slow. It was deliberate. It was steady. And the the effects of it are are consummated in in our present age. Right. So, what would be some examples of that? What would be some signs that somebody we could point to and say that's a lack of fatherlessness? That that's a lack of this fathers having turned their heart to their children. So, um, <clears throat> the whole thing works as a cycle. I think with the African American community, we see a large percentage of incarceration of males get the man out of the home. It leaves the single parent home, with his, which is generally the mother, to raise the children. The mother means well, does her very best, um, but she can't do what a father can do, mm -hmm. no matter how hard she tries. She can't be there to guide as a father should guide. Um, and with that, then we see the result. Um, which is basically a, a fatherless generation. Um. You know, as you're thinking, I thought about, you know, the Me Too movement that, mm -hmm. you know, last year really blew up. Harvey Weinstein, kind of this whole uprise again, uprising against um, white males who were in power that, that abused that power to have their way with women. Um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm against that. I'm against the abuse of women of every kind. I'm against men in power of any ethnicity, ethnic group mm -hmm. using that to hurt women. Some of those women, however, got themselves in trouble because their daddy wasn't there. That's right. And That's if right. they would be honest and we could have the conversation and not just blow up in my face for what I just said, if they mm -hmm. could be honest and sit down and have the conversation, that won't ever happen to my daughters. So, well, not like it happened to some of them because I, I have taught them, I have guided them, I've protected them even to this day. Mm -hmm. I think one of them might even be behind me in yeah, the studio. Yeah, audience back is. over there. Um, <laughs> that uh, that could never happen to them because mm -hmm. they have a father that says, no, you can't go down that path of life because mm -hmm. I know that there's this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And so it's interesting that you're saying, look, it'd be nice if we can have a conversation about it. It's exactly what he's saying in the message someone would want to jump on that, be triggered about that, and take the conversation away from fathers to somehow you're accepting this abuse of women and somehow you're misogynist, whatever. Toxic that, male. Or yes, but that's not the issue. The issue is that when fathers are present, 
there's something that a father can put, uh, proper fathers, can put and direct in society, in their children, that will take them on the right path, and certain things will be off, um, off of the table. Certain things won't even be a consideration because there's a man present, a proper man present, that is leading and directing in the way that a man should. Right, and I think too, you mentioned the Me Too movement, and that's, I think, a very careful subject to deal with, but I think, really the Me Too movement is a target for the man also. Mm -hmm. And I am not saying that no one has ever been abused because they have been. Totally. Mm -hmm. And what it does is is it, it portrays a male figure in authority as a predator. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's then, a, it so a then you're conditioned right. where that every male figure that's in authority is a predator. Mm -hmm. So you trust nobody then and then you eliminate all your fathers. Mm -hmm. Right. So it so the the so back to again me too movement if you've been abused and you want to and you should speak out in 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 a way to say I'm going to regain power over my life I'm not going to live in fear right I'm not going to um, live a, a victim in my mm -hmm. mind to this problem I'm a hundred percent behind that that the solution is not attacking every male in authority there's a there's a there's a there's a gospel solution that actually satisfies both needs and that is the need of men in authority mm -hmm. and that satisfies the need to protect and to build up and to support and to encourage women by the way we are four strong women oh, right. in leadership yes, i don't know if everybody would know that i think people might look at us and suspect that our women are oppressed or suppressed that because we believe according to the apostle paul women should guide the home that we don't believe in strong female leadership in the church, mm -hmm. um, and which in fact we do. And so um, the answer here is found, I think, as you're saying in your message. So what I'd like to ask you, John, Brother John, is, you know, this was kind of a, so you didn't just call out the problem, which is good, it's necessary, here's the problem, but you did what every good preacher does and they provide hope, they give the answer. So the problem has been lack of fathers. And that's where it starts. Lack of fathers, the children can't turn. It's hard for the children to turn their hearts. Talk about the solution. What's your call to society? Here you have a chance to speak to the world. What's the call in your message? What are you, what are you trying to inspire people to? So I believe I said in my message that verse 6, Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, and I can read it just for the sake of, of having it on record here. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Um, so I think the whole New Covenant period is summed up in this verse. Mm -hmm. um, it's the healing of turning the heart of the father to the children so that the heart of the children can be turned to the fathers so that everyone can be as they should be, as God created us to be. Um, so. Then, that being said, our, our solution then is having spiritual fathers that are able to acknowledge that they are a father and that are able to acknowledge that they have children and reach out to those children um, so that the heart of the children can be turned to the fathers. So you're saying step one, and I'm making steps just for the sake of conversation. I know it's not as simple as just say step one, but um, you're saying that in the New Testament dispensation, there was this elevation of the idea or principle of a spiritual father who can then help the physical fathers who can then help their fathers-to-be, the children who will become fathers and mothers. That's what you're saying. Yes, sir. And I like how, if you, if you explain further, I like how you talked about that the spiritual fathers would actually acknowledge mm -hmm. that they were fathers and that they would then acknowledge that they have children. What do you mean by that for an audience that may not know? So um, I think that there's a lot of fathers in the world that have children that reject their children. Mm -hmm. They have no interest in, in caring for the child or being involved in their lives for whatever reason. Um, and I think we see that even in the church world. We have spiritual, should-be fathers, leaders, pastors, that 
it seems that more the burden is themselves, mm -hmm. making themselves a name, making themselves a career, mm. um, being good speakers, making good money. And so they're after themselves more than after their children, should be children, would be children. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what we have seen in this, in this work of restoration is the fathers rising up with a real burden a real concern for the children. Mm -hmm. um, so I spoke earlier about the Me Too movement. Um, we have fathers that have proven themselves worthy of our trust. That's good. That's good, brother. They have lived before us. They didn't just <clears throat> um, all, all of a sudden appear before us and say, we're your fathers. We don't know you, but we're your dad. You right. need to listen to <laughs> right. us. You've been with us, you know, for all these years. And we've known you and seen your lives and um, it, it moves us to turn to you when we can know that like we have a father that we can trust. We've seen your lives. We know you're right. We know what you're about. You're not interested in just building up yourself. You're not interested in just uh, cushioning your own chair, but like you're, you're caring about us, our spiritual well-being and, and the decisions that are made and, and things that are taught to us and brought to us are for our benefit, mm -hmm. like for our advancement, even at your suffering. And I think Paul deals with that mm -hmm. in, in, in his epistles. Basically, he says, I put my neck out there for you, for you to prosper. Like I've, I've been, I've been robbed. I've been, you know, like poor and everything so that you would be rich. Yes. And we have that, like we've been made rich. Mm -hmm because of your poverty, like you're, you're giving your, your sacrifice to us. So um, it's easy to, again, back to Noah, to look at your spiritual father and say, oh, they messed up. Like, what do you, why do you say that? Or that didn't make sense or whatever. And, and, and those are really just opportunities, I think, from the enemy to seek an opportunity to tear down the father Mm -hmm. in our mind frame because when that is torn down then we can no longer receive help so you're saying just to clear, to reiterate you're saying that as Shem and Japheth were respectful of their natural father there should be the same and you, you talked about them maybe having a discuss like you're imagining them discussing and you talked about them thinking about what about our legacy that mm -hmm. will come out of all of this that there should be the same kind of regard, same kind of affection, same kind of hearts turning to the fathers that are our spiritual fathers that this, the text that you gave refers to for Noah. Yes, sir. In the light of the fact that we're very human. <laughs> And I think it's important to say, too, like we're not talking about immoral sins. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're not talking about someone that, that is caught in an immoral sin and then we're still supposed to trust them and they're still supposed to be our Very father. Good we're talking about human human mistakes. I mean, you might make a mistake in judgment. Uh, you might not choose the best thing. And, and, and yet we're not dealing with sin. We're dealing with a simple human mistake. Right. So our fathers have proven themselves to us pure, holy, um, they're still human, which is a good thing because we're still human. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, so it allows us to still be connected, you know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, if you were angels, then we would lose a connection. Right. And yes, we would, we would listen because you're superior or whatever, and you were sent by God to tell us something, but, but there wouldn't be a connection. But because of humanity, there is a connection. And isn't that how God is always, you know, that's the pattern. Adam is our Mm -hmm. still our father. He's still the first father of humanity. We yes. have men like Abraham, who is the father of faith. And we have faith because somebody like Abraham was willing to have faith. You know, um, the scripture says that um, Elijah was a man of like passions. There's always been a divine narrative of stay connected to the people on this earth, not just not just right. God in heaven. And, and that's primarily our father. Um, Jesus taught us to pray our Father which art in heaven. But there's a definite connection, as you mentioned, in this life that is indispensable to living happy, living fulfilled, living um, to your highest potential. Yes, sir. 
Brother, one thing I want to say, as it seems like we're winding down, but it seems like in turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and then the hearts of the children to their fathers, it seems to me that there's a mutual need. Like we know that the children need fathers, whether that's spiritual fathers or whether that's your biological fathers. But it seems to me, would you brother say that the fathers actually need the children? There's a mutual need. I need the children. Yes, and sir. they need me. Like we couldn't just say the children need the fathers, but the fathers have no use whatsoever of the children. So there's that connection that prevents generational gaps, it prevents identity lapses, just as long as there's a mutual need, like I need young people and they need older people. And and there's yes, there's an awareness between both of us. Like we, we're not I'm not just telling you what to do, you know, young people are always like this, listen to me. But I'm 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 feeding from you, I'm feeding from your from your energy, your intelligence. I'm treating you with respect. Right. So there's a mutuality there. Even though the fathers need to be in that position in order for that to happen. Would you would you agree? Absolutely. I mean it's impossible for a father to be a father without a child. Oh brother. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean it's such it's wisdom. like such I mean, wisdom. Yeah, he's wise, brother. That's why you gotta get the message. <laughs> so I think it's like two like like preachers that say they're preachers but they mm -hmm. have no congregation. Like right. what kind of a preacher is that? Right. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, I'm Very just good. preaching so good that nobody's listening. Well, <laughs> maybe you've never been yeah, a father, right. you know. Like, <laughs> maybe you've never been. <laughs> it's, maybe you've never. And I say, I think as a father, you know, for sure. myself, like, like I see my children, mm -hmm. and I can bear things because I'm a father that other people can't bear because With they're not children. a father. That's right. right. That's they right. see That's something, right. they're like, oh, like that's so terrible. Like, well. It's not the end of the world, you know. Like, <laughs> like I think we'll come out of this. You know? Sure, that's good. That's very good. Amen. Well, brother, the message was excellent. We're not doing really justice was. to the message. There was such a divine anointing and inspiration on the message, brother. So thank you for obeying the Lord. Thank mm -hmm. you for the time that you spent in Amen. prayer and fasting and study that produced the message. And I want to thank you too, because most people don't understand what it is that we do here in in waiting or preferring our brethren. There was a lengthy wait before you move, and I appreciate the courage and the faith that it took for you to say, okay, I'm going to do this. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity and, and move in the Lord. So I want to thank you for that. Um, it has been one of the weightiest messages that you preached. It, it was a masterpiece. So if you've never, if you, if you can, you want to listen to this one. It's, it's good for your soul. It's good for your home. It, it will help heal things that have been hurt in your home for long generations. And brother... I want to thank you for that. And thank yes, you for joining us on The Voice of Seven Thunders. Amen. Thank you. You've been listening to another podcast of The Voice of Seven Thunders. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get this, if you'd like to get this and other content of The Church of God, you can find that by going to churchofgod.net. May the Lord bless you.